Hey guys, how's it going? Today I just want to take a moment to go through my watch collection. So, as some of you may know who have seen some of my previous videos, some of them are videos on watch unboxings. And these can be smart watches, they can be digital watches, they can be uh, traditional watches, right? I'm just, I'm a big fan of watches. Um, I like to, you know, see what kind of watch pairs with which outfit, which watch to wear on a certain day. Um, it's kind of like a fashion statement. Um, you know, some days I might prefer to wear a smartwatch for a more utilitarian look. Other days I might prefer to wear a more traditional watch for a more formal look, right? It all depends. And I do have a collection here of watches so I'm going to show you guys. And some of them are more collector's pieces. Some of them are watches that I actually wear. Um, others are just like, you know, watches I don't wear so much. It's just to look at having my collection. Um, and other ones are just weird. So let's just take a look at all these different watches. So I have on the bottom here, these are mostly digital watches, smart watches are included in that. And then on top here, I have more uh, traditional watches, I would say. Um, so I'm just going in more or less chronological order here. Okay, I'm gonna show you guys my first watch, okay? So this is the first watch, uh, actually it's not the first watch I ever wore, I think that would be a Timex, right? When I was a kid, I think I wore like one of those uh, cheap Timex watches that had the indigo, like black backlight or something like that. Um, you know, like Timex makes a lot of cheap digital watches, so I think that was just one of the many that I wore back when I was in high school. But uh, I would say the Seiko 5, this watch is the first like real um, watch that I kind of really like started caring about watches. This one is kind of the first one. Yeah, so the Seiko 5, really, really good value watch. Um, as many people who have Seiko 5s would tell you, this watch is extraordinary for the price. Uh, it's only like 50 bucks, right? It's like 50, 60 bucks. And for you that, you get an automatic movement and you get a day and a date. Uh, and you get, you know, the water resistance and everything, automatic. So you get a lot for 50 60 bucks so this watch is still one of the best values um i think this watch i i got back in 2011 right uh after i graduated university i just i found the seiko 5 because i was just kind of new to watch collecting at the time and i just wanted something to start out with and as a beginner watch the seiko 5 is really nice and i bet a lot of people started off with this watch as well um, so one of the links is missing right because um I don't know, I guess I tried to repair it at one point and kind of lost the links for it. That's why it's like this. But I wore this for about a year or so. Uh, it's a really nice watch. So again, for the price, you know, it's really, really good. Um, very, very tiny. Actually, this this watch is pretty, it's pretty small, right? Well, it's like a 38 millimeter or something like that. Where it's very small, it is very small. But that's fine, right? Because I think that uh, 42 millimeters and above is getting a little bit big for me now. But this is a nice watch. Seiko, you know, of course, very well-known Japanese company. Uh, especially the Seiko 5, I feel like it's one of the best value watches that you can get. Uh, especially for mechanical watches, right? If you're looking for a mechanical watch, which I've begun to appreciate more these days, um, Seiko 5 is a really beginner choice, but it's a very nice beginner choice because you get so many complications for the price. Again, $50, $60 is unbeatable for this kind of value that you get. The movement is... Uh, I do believe it's it's still a Japanese movement, but it's like assembled in Malaysia. Because um, as far as I know, Seiko uses their own movements and their own parts. And uh, for their higher-end watches, it's all assembled in Japan. So obviously Seiko Presage and uh, Grand Seiko, all made in Japan. But for the Seiko 5, uh, why it's so cheap is uh, I believe it's, a, it's their parts and their movement, but it's assembled in Malaysia or Southeast Asia. That's why it's so cheap. But anyways, you get a nice exhibition case back. Right, you can see that the movement is, although nothing special, this is the pretty good for what you get for the price, right? And again, we're talking 50, 60 bucks here, right? And this is what you're getting, so that's pretty good. See, so that's pretty good. I mean, you're getting quality Seiko, reliable Seiko movements, Seiko parts. Yeah, Seiko watches are some of the most reliable in the industry. They're basically the Toyota of watches, right? workhorses. Anyways, this was my the first watch that I really kind of cared about, right? The Seiko 5. And then this watch, the Seiko Kinetic, is one I wore for a very long time. So I wore this for about five years, four or five years, 
2012 to about 2015. Yeah, about four years I wore this watch. So this one has been me with me for a while. And uh, what's unique about the Seiko Kinetic? Well, first of all, I bought it because it looks really nice. I, I think this retailed for about $250 US, which is um, not as cheap as the Seiko 5, but I think in comparison to all these other watches, it's actually a pretty good price. It's pretty affordable. So $250 bucks and you get this nice two-tone steel bracelet right here. Right. I like this two-tone uh, gold finish and blue finish. I really like the combination of blue and gold, actually. I've always had a soft spot for that color combination. But uh, yeah, nice two-tone finish here. You can see the blue dial and the gold indices, gold hands. Again, gold and blue is the theme here uh, with a date, no day. Uh, and it is not a mechanical watch. It's a quartz watch. Uh, but what's special about the Kinetic is that it's actually a quartz watch driven by movement. So much the same way how automatic watches are basically mechanical watches driven by your movement, right? They're powered by your movement. The Seiko Kinetic is a quartz watch that's powered by your movement. So basically you get the accuracy of a quartz watch with, um, you know, the convenience of not having to, to swap out the batteries, right? So that's why I wore this one for such a long time because, uh, again, it's just like automatic watches, you can power it forever with your movement, right? You, you never have to charge it with uh, or exchange your batteries, I would say, right? You never have to change out your batteries uh, and you get the accuracy of a quartz movement. And, you know, most people know that quartz is more accurate than mechanical, right? Even though mechanical is usually considered more prestigious, quartz watches have their place and um, they are, you know, obviously more accurate on ge in general, and it's cheaper, by the way, as well. So, yep, that's the uh, Seiko Kinetic. I, have the, I wore this one for probably the longest out of all these different watches. <laughs> this was the, the main watch I had for a very long time. Because uh, I, th I just thought it was good enough for a very long time. Right? It's a solid watch. It's pretty durable. Got the steel links, you know, 5 ATM water resistance. Been with me f uh, through a lot. And uh, never had to change out the batteries because that's what the Kinetic is for. Right? It's powered by your movement. Um, but of course, the downside is you get this quartz. For quartz watches, the second hand moves very uh, rigidly, right? I mean, you can tell here that the, the second hand is moving very rigidly, right? In comparison to a smooth mechanical watch, you get that nice sweep. You don't get that with a quartz watch. But uh, as far as looks is concerned and reliability, durability, uh, accuracy, right? Seiko Kinetic is pretty nice. So anyways, got this one. That was my second watch after the Seiko 5 that I really cared about. All right, um, before I get to these, just going in chronological order of how I got these, um, the next one would be the Fossil Abacus. So this watch is more of a, a collector's watch. So I don't wear this watch because it's really, it's an outdated smartwatch, but it's good as a collector's item because this was the very first smartwatch kind of I want to say the first smartwatch. I mean, technically Seiko released one of those TV watches like back in the 80s. Like those were really the, the first smartwatches, right? And then Casio had their data banks too. The first watch that kind of had uh, its own distinct operating system. So this one was running Palm OS, believe it or not. This one came out in 2003. And Fossil, you know, a lot of people decry Fossil with being a fashion brand, and they are. But they do, they are pretty uh, technologically forward-looking, I would say. And even if you look at their recent watches, they have a lot of uh, newer technologies in them, right? They embrace the smartwatch trend, right? A lot of their watches have Wear OS running on them. Uh, but they actually started with Palm OS well, all the way back in 2003. This is way before anyone else was doing something like that. So got to give props to Fossil for that. The Abacus, um, I did a video on this before, and you should probably watch that one because I don't know if this watch charges still anymore. <laughs> But uh, it actually charges via mini USB, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it charges with a mini USB cable right here. And then uh, runs Palm OS. So, you know, if you ever used a Palm Pilot, you can do the same stuff you can do on here. Just the PIM uh, stuff, the calendar, appointments, contacts, calculator. That's all on here. It's, it was running a full-blown Palm OS. And uh, you can put your Palm OS apps on it, which is really cool. I think this was the, uh, the scroller, right? You can go up and down and click push in to click it um, and these are probably the menu actions right and this may be the home button here but it's really cool just for my collection right and obviously don't wear this anymore um, but it for the historical value of this watch 
I have it in my collection. Okay. This is technically the first watch that ran its own uh, dedicated operating system, right? Palm OS. So this came back all the way back in 2003. This came out way before Apple Watch and Pebble and everything else. So just a cool piece of history there. Next, we have uh, the Pebble Time Steel. So I actually had the original Pebble Time, and then I upgraded to a Pebble Time Steel. Of course, this was on Kickstarter. And I would say that Pebble is the company that kind of kickstarted the smartwatch craze, right? All the way back in 2012, I think. And um, many people bought their watches on Kickstarter. And I know it seems very primitive by today's standards. Pebble's no longer in business. But uh, another company named Rebel, I believe, is maintaining all the software for it now. So you can still use Pebble Time. And I have done a video just like trying to use Pebble Time uh, recently. Right, uh, I think last year I did a video on it. So yes, you can still run this this watch. You can still use it, uh, even though the company is out of business. But uh, it's it was pretty good for the time, right? Uh, Pebble Time Steel, um, I really liked it at the time. So you can see I have the Kickstarter edition because I actually backed it on Kickstarter. So I was one of the OG Pebble Time owners. But uh, yeah, I like the I like this watch when it came out. I mean, at the time. There weren't many other smartwatches. Apple Watch wasn't in the business yet, right? And uh, the Android Wear watches just start, started coming out, I think, at that time. So there really wasn't much competition for Pebble. Um, and really, Pebble stayed popular for a few years, even after the Wear OS devices came out, because even after Apple Watch came out, and the reason is because of battery life, because they used a monochrome screen for a very long time. And that had the advantage of keeping the battery life, even though it wasn't very good looking. But uh, Pebble Times could run, or Pebble, the original one, and Pebble Times, they can run for a very long time, at least a week or more, which is a lot compared to other smartwatches that you have to charge at least once or twice a day, right? Once every two days. So uh, people like the battery life on the Pebbles. But of course, the problem was the design is really outdated. I mean, look at the size of these bezels, right? And the, how small the actual usable screen is. And this is the Pebble Time Steel. This is the year they actually came out with a color screen. So before that, they only came out with monochrome displays. And obviously, those aren't very pleasing to the eyes. And yeah, I mean, in the end, of course, Apple Watch and Wear OS devices, they won out. Tizen OS watches, right? They, they won out because uh, they had a more modern looking design display. And people really care about that. But Pebble, I got to give props for being a pioneer in the smartwatch business, right? Uh, I think this was the going back button and... This is the Pebble Time was really unique because that that had that Pebble OS interface, which is you can go backwards in time to see what you did, and you can go forwards in time uh, to you know see your events and stuff, and then you have your current watch face, which is your current notifications and stuff. So you had that time interface, which is a pretty cool concept actually. So yeah, this is a Pebble Time Steel. Again, I don't really wear this. I could, but I don't really wear it. There's really not much reason to wear a Pebble Time these days, right? You can still use it. It's still usable, but there's way better options now for smartwatches than to use a Pebble Time, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's that one. And then next, I have the Casio Data Bank. This one is uh, so the Data Bank series, I believe, actually came out in the '80s. So this has been around for a while. Uh, this one is I picked it up a few years ago. Uh, just really cool. It's pretty cheap. You know, fifty bucks. Pick one of these up. Um, and you know, as you can see, it's still running, right? It's always running because it runs on a battery and it lasts for a very long time. I mean, if you're looking for, um, a nice digital watch, can't go wrong with a Casio. Casios are really reliable watches. Um, and they kind of pioneered the digital watch craze, I would say. So Casios are cool. And I just want to have a, a cool looking like calculator watch, right? Because these days, if you have a smartwatch, obviously you have a calculator app on those watches, right? Like if you have a smartwatch like these guys, yeah, you have a calculator watch. You have a, you have a, this is a, a phone book, right? Calculator, alarm, uh, stopwatch, uh, day, this is a yeah, world timer, right? Um, you have all this on all these different smartwatches, but part of me wants to go back you know, to a time where we didn't have those smartwatches and you didn't have the special operating systems and stuff like that. You wanted to go to a time where, you know, without multi-touch and you had analog controls like this, right? These are analog controls, the numpad here, and it's just hipster, right? I call this a really hipster watch because sometimes, you know, when I wear this watch and I go outside and um, 
just walking down the street wearing something like this and people are going to ask about it, right? Because it's, it's a super hipster device, right? How many people do you see out there wearing a, a Casio data bank? Not many, right? First of all, like even traditional watches aren't super popular anymore. And even if you're wearing a watch, you're going to be wearing a smartwatch, right? And just to have this retro throwback watch is, is really cool. So I basically keep this and I do wear it sometimes, right? When I, when I want to be hipster, I wear this watch. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, screw all the uh, smartwatch operating systems. I want something. I want to be able to actually, you know, press buttons on my watch, um, you know, when I'm lining up on a Starbucks or something like that. You know, just, just how cool is that? It makes me feel like I'm in the late 80s, early 90s again and uh, in, on the bleeding edge of tech back then. Right. So anyways, yeah, I just call this a hipster watch. Casio data bank and it's very inexpensive too very easy to get so next watch I want to talk about is the Orient Sun and Moon so this watch is um, a model that I've had uh, not this particular version but I had the older version the older Sun and Moon for I don't know a few years and I used it a lot back in 2016 when I was in Korea so this was my main watch when I was in Korea uh, the previous version and uh, yeah, it served me pretty well. It had uh, a gold case just like this one, and it had brown leather strap. This one has a blue leather strap, which I actually like better because, like, again, I said that gold and blue are kind of my favorite color combinations. And yeah, I wore it for about two years, and it was pretty nice. I mean, it was definitely a watch that looks more expensive than it actually is. And Orient is a company that's very, very high value company, like even more so than Seiko, I would say. Yeah, so Orient, um, not that well known, not as well known as Seiko anyways. Um, the average person probably wouldn't know it as well as the Seiko. Uh, but Japanese, all their movements are done in-house, right? They use their own movements, their own, uh, their own parts and everything, all assembled in-house. Uh, made in Japan, uh, very good quality, very good value for the price. And uh, I think... If you're looking for a watch that's kind of a step up from the Seiko 5, I think the Orient watches are very good. And I really like Orient watches. I think they give you fantastic value. I think that even their most expensive Orient stars wouldn't be over 1000 So I would say Orient is a brand. None of their watches really go beyond 1000 Most of their watches in the $200, $300, $400 range. Yeah. And for that price, you get a very, very good watch. So this was pretty much the first time... I really cared about mechanical watches, right? Because I had the Seiko 5 before, then the Kinetic after that. Um, and then I saw my brother, he was carrying an Orient Bambino, which is their most popular model. And, and uh, that kind of got me back into mechanical watches again. And this is the Sun and Moon, the version that I like the most. Uh, this particular one is the limited edition model, right? So I have the original model, which has different complications. It has the day complication. Um, and uh, date complication as well. This one doesn't have the date or the date. Instead of that, it still has a sun and moon complication, obviously. Otherwise, it couldn't be called a sun and moon. Sun and moon complication is basically a day and night indicator. And then in addition to that, they have a heartbeat movement, an open heart movement. So this is what's unique about the limited edition is they have that open heart. Most of the sun and moon models don't really have the open heart, just the limited edition models do. So, yeah, and uh, very well-decorated movement for the price. Uh, again, made in Japan, all the parts, the movement come in-house. So at this price range, like I would say Orient is a better value than Seiko even. And Seiko is a really nice value for the price, right? Um, they also move, make all their movements in-house and uh, you know most of their models, their higher-end models are made in Japan um, and they use their own parts and everything. So they're already pretty good value. But Orient is an even better value, especially um, their main line, the, the Orient Star, uh, I would say the Orient Star is on a level that's similar to a Seiko Presage, uh, and it's often cheaper, right? Even Orient Star is their highest end model you can find for under $600, and for that, it's a really good price, really good value. Nice looking dials, again, uses their own parts and movement, so technically, they are in-house, right? They're in-house movement, uh, all for under $600, so which is most of their models. So this one I got for $500 because it was limited edition, but the usual sun and moons are like $300. So yeah, I'd say if you're looking for a really good value mechanical watch, you really can't go wrong with an Orient. I think they're a really underrated brand and uh, a good starter brand for a lot of people who are into mechanical watches and we're just starting to get into watch collecting, right? Uh, so this, this watch is kind of the watch that 
started me off on mechanical watches and really led me to appreciate them. So anyways, yeah, then I got this model because I like the open heart design and I like the gold and blue color combination, of course, and it's limited edition as well. So that's also pretty cool. Next watch I'm going to talk about is the, uh, I'm going to talk about this one. This is the Oris GMT. I got this in 2018, a few years ago. This is still my most expensive watch in this collection, I believe. It's about $2,000 when I got this watch. Yeah, I bought, I got this totally brand new. Uh, and it's definitely the most expensive of this, of this collection. Yeah, so Oris is a, is a Swiss company that has a, a pretty decent heritage. It goes back to the early 1900s. And at the time, I wanted to have a watch that had a GMT feature, right? Because I was going to be uh, living in Korea for a few months, so I wanted to have a, a watch that had a dual time zone feature, and I really liked the design of the GMT one. This is a Greenwich Mean Time, a limited edition model. It's limited to a thousand pieces. It has an engraving of Sir Sanford Fleming on the back of it, who uh, came up with the concept of Greenwich Mean Time, and I like how they do it because a lot of the GMT watches that you see, like. They, they copy Rolex, basically, and which is basically um, they have a third hand, and that hand is used to tell the time in the other time zone, right? And I don't like that. I just feel like that's a kind of a really cheap way of doing it. Um, very, very basic. I mean, I, I know it works for most people, but I don't like it. I wanted something a little bit different. That's how most watches did it. Oris did something different. They have this little subdial here with the image of the globe. And this one is going to be the second time zone. And I like this much better than just using a, a third hand, which is kind of just a cop out in my opinion. So, and it has a second subdial, right? Also very cool. No seconds hand, it uses a subdial instead. Date window is down at the bottom here instead of on the right, as in a lot of watches. Um, and you can see the design and the finish of the dial is pretty nice. It has a galoshing on the dial here, you can see here. So you can see that Oris did a pretty good job here. And uh, I'm okay with not being able to see the the movement itself because sometimes I think engraved on the back makes it a little bit more special than just showing a open case back. But yeah, still like this watch. Um, I like the uh, the finishing of the dial. Uh, the movement's pretty nice. It's, it's a Salido movement, so it's nothing in-house or anything like that. But uh, Salidas are pretty reliable. The SW200, right? The ETA 2824 is pretty much the same, fairly reliable, and it has the two pushers on the side to adjust the uh, time zones. So, again, I used this watch when I was in Korea, both in 2018 and last year. So, it was useful when I was in Korea for the dual time zone feature. And also, a nice looking watch as well. All right, next watch I'm going to talk about is the Apple Watch. So, when, after I got the Apple iPhone 11 Pro, I got this watch. And uh, yeah, because really there is no other competition if you're looking for a smartwatch for an iPhone, right? <laughs> you have Apple Watch and that's really your only option. This is the Series 3. Uh, I didn't get the newer series. I don't think I need it. Um, but yeah, it's pretty solid smartwatch. Um, of course, Apple Watches are the most popular smartwatches. Uh, if you see any person wearing a smartwatch, it's it's a good chance that's an Apple Watch, right? Uh, these are just the most popular smartwatches. Um, and because of the good reason that uh, everything Apple makes is generally good quality. So they make uh, items that are expensive, I know. Some people might call them overpriced. But uh, the way that they work, the UI and everything is, is very smooth. And uh, even though the Series 3 came out several years back, Apple's still selling them. And uh, they're, they're still like very, very responsive interface and um, a lot of apps. Just whatever people want on a smartwatch, they can get it done with an Apple Watch, right? So if I have an iPhone, there's really no other choice, right? I mean, I know these other wa smartwatches I have, they work with the iPhone, but none of them are going to work as well as the Apple Watch. It's just so integrated, so optimized. So yeah, it's a standard Apple Watch Series 3 with the silicone strap pretty much the cheapest model. What else can I say? It's a smartwatch of choice for iPhone users, right? Once I switched to the iPhone 11 Pro and I want to have a, a smartwatch that pairs with it, pretty much this was the only option. All right, and next I have the Yunhans Meister Calendar. So this was my first German watch and I really like the design of this watch. Um, I feel like this watch is a, 
it really appeals to me because, first of all, I like Bauhaus design, right? Bauhaus design is that German school of thought and generally very minimalistic, uh, functional design, right? So this is going to be a generalization, but I think in general, German watches focus more on the functionality of the design. They focus on the pure simplicity, um, and then, you know, the features are very, very functional, right? They don't focus so much on making it stand out. Um, they don't add all these unnecessary complications, right? I think, like, compared to Swiss watches, Swiss watches tend to be a little bit more flashy. They focus on the color of the dials, you know, the different complications, um, you know, just how nice can they make it look, uh, whereas German watches are, they just want to make it look functional, and I think... Junhans is a is a good example of that. Nomos, right? Glashit Original, all these uh, other watch German watch brands, they do a great job of it. And um, I like the Junhans. I think it's again, it's a it's a brand that's amongst the more affordable German brands, right? So Nomos is like two thousand dollars, three thousand dollar range, so still affordable for a German watch, but um, still out of reach for a lot of people, right? The Junhans, I got this one for about 1500 and Junhans watches tend to stay between the 1K to 2K range. So in general, I don't think they're that expensive and uh, they're still in reach of most people. And I feel like Nomos, they do come down to under 2K sometimes, but most of the time they're still above 2K, which makes it still kind of out of reach, even though I know it's it's still relatively affordable, at least compared to you know the other German brands like Glashit Original or Elang and Sone. Those are just out of reach for, yeah, I would say most people, right? Just the rich people can buy those ones. But for me, yeah, I like the Yuhans. I like the design. It's uh, like I said, I think German watches focus on the functionality, uh, just putting in the complications that make the most sense, not necessarily because they look cool, right? I'm talking about turbillions here, right? <laughs> like Swiss watch watchmakers tend to put in like open hearts, tur turbillions. They flash up the movements a lot to make it look cool. They put a lot of... Uh, yeah, decorations on the movements and stuff, which Germans are just like, okay, what does the user want to, to see, right, on their watch? Okay, we want to see the, the day here. You want to see the month, right? Not actually, this is the only watch I have that shows a month. Uh, the day, and then the moon phase. So that's four complications already. And they didn't take up too much space, right? I, I like to have a clean dial. I don't like have a, a dial with a bunch of complications taking up too much space, right? Like power reserve is one of the worst offenders. I really don't like power reserve as a complication. I think it's fairly useless for an automatic watch. Um, so I don't like that complication, but a lot of watch manufacturers, they put power reserve. Um, but the Yuhans doesn't do it, right? They just put in the the ones that make the most sense to me, right? I wanna see the day and the date and the month. And moon phase is not too uh, useful but it is just a nice looking complication and they fit it in this small amount of space. So it's not like it's taking up anything extra. So I really like that. Um, and yeah, just the basils is very small. It's definitely not that big. Like if you compare it to the orange sun and moon have, you can see uh, this basil is definitely a little bit thicker, right? Or even the Frederick Constant, I'll talk about this one next, but the Frederick Constant, bigger basil, right? The Yunhan is very, very minimalist, uh, small, basil here which looks more elegant in my opinion and then uh the movement here is i don't think this is an in-house movement but it is pretty decently decorated it might be a swiss movement because i know that some german watches use swiss movements so that might be the case with Juhans. it's not a glass shit brand so it's not like a nomos they don't do um nomos is a cool brand because they make everything in-house but uh, i don't think that's the case for Juhans. but i do like the design of the Juhans. The Bauhaus design is really nice. Their max bill models are really popular. And they're, the price is okay. It's not like super affordable. It's not like under a thousand, but uh, it's not too expensive either. So I definitely like this watch. I would say out of all the watches I have, if I just want to take one day to day, just for, you know, just when I'm going outside, I don't know which one to choose. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just want to go outside. Then I just pick this one as an everyday watch because generally it has all the functions I want or need. So yeah, in that case, I just pick up the Yunhan's Meister calendar. Yep. All right, and next watch I'll talk about is the Frederick Constant Slimline Moon Phase. So I originally had another model which had a rose gold case, white dial, got that back in 2018. And uh, that was my main dress watch for that year. Um, and then this year I swapped it out for this one, which is a blue dial in a silver case, which I like better because I love blue. That's my favorite color. And I think that Frederick Constant really makes the best 
amongst the best blues in their watches, right? It's just, it's just so deep, and it looks amazing, especially their moon face, right? I really love their moon face because, um, I mean, just compared to the Yunhans, for example, right? Um, okay, here's the moon, the Yunhans moon face, and you can see the Frederick Constant moon face. You can see how much, I don't know, it just looks better, right? Don't you think that just looks better? Like, I just think that the FC does a way better job on their moon face compared to other watch brands. They, they make some of the best looking dress watches in general, I think. So Frederick Constant, really good brand, I think. They're affordable, uh, relatively, right? Most of their watches in the 1K to 2K range. Um, I think they're really good quality. I really like the elegance of their designs and even their movements. You can see their movements are very highly decorated compared to other watches in the price range, right? So if you look at a Oris or a Longines, a Tissot, a Hamilton, even a, like a Tag Her, right? Or the Yunhans even, right? You see the, showing the Yunhans movement here. You see, oh, there's some decoration on the movement, but the FC just blows these watches out of the water with their, look at the movement here, right? And this is a, their own in-house movement. So Frederick Constant makes, they make watches that use ETA or Salida movements, but this is their in-house movement and you can still get it for under 2K. So to me, these are good value watches because you're getting an in-house Swiss movement, very nice, very highly decorated, um, and very beautiful design, right? You're getting that for under 2K, like that's a really good deal actually. So the thing about FCs are, I guess because of the fact, maybe the fact that they sell a lot of their watches in department stores, or I don't know, a lot of people just have this snobby, condescending attitude towards Frederick Constant and maybe because they're uh, not a very old watch brand they just started in the late 80s I think it was 88 um, so they don't have a lot of heritage but they make good watches and they make it good at an affordable price so I don't think there's any reason to hate on FCs they make quartz watches sure but a lot of other manufacturers do right a lot of other Swiss watchmakers make quartz watches too. So I don't see any need to hate on Frederick Constant. I think they offer really good value for the price. Among the Swiss watch brands, I think FC is one of the better values that you can buy, right? So there's a few. There's Oris, I think is really good. Um, I think Longings is pretty good. And um, Tissot and Hamilton are all pretty good values as well. But I think FC is probably the best among them because their MSRP is usually like $3,000, $4,000 but they get heavily discounted online, which means you can buy them for like one third the price. And that's what happened here. This one originally, MSRP is $3,400, $3,500 for the Slimline Moonface. And I got it online for $1,200, uh, yeah, $1,200, right? That's a huge discount, right? And for that price, like you're getting a in-house Swiss movement for that price with a very beautiful finish. Like that's a really good deal. So I don't get the hate towards Frederick Constant. I think for the price, I think they're actually really good values um, among Swiss brands as far as that's concerned, right? Like I don't think that any other Swiss watch in the same price range, um, I'm talking about the MSRP because I don't, I don't think these are really worth it for the MSRP price, but for the discounted price, I don't think there's many other watches that really compete with it. I really love design. Um, beautiful dress watch. Yeah, this is basically my go-to dress watch. Is the Frederick Constant Slimline Moonface. All right, and then I'm um, talk about my Moto 360 third generation. Uh, I had the original Moto 360 way back in 2014. That was the first uh, smartwatch that came out with a circular display. So you gotta understand, back in those days, it was the Pebble Time. It was um, I had a few others, Meta M1, I think. They all had square designs. And the Moto 360 was the first one that came out with a round design. I think the LG Urbane was, was another one that came out soon after. But uh, it was kind of a big deal when it came out because, you know, it's a traditional... Round is obviously the traditional shape of watches, right? And uh, the Moto 360 was the first one. This is the third generation. They came back after a few years of uh, dormancy, right? So uh, I think they got revived. It's not exactly Motorola. I think Motorola just kind of uh, licensed this to a Chinese manufacturer it seems like and then they kind of just put their put the their name on it and then made this third generation and um, I think it's okay uh, I don't think it's the best value because this was $350 I think it still has issues it's not as smooth as the Apple Watch or the Tizen OS um, 
And the hardware is um, yeah, pretty much the same between all these different Wear OS brands. But you're just getting something that's just okay. If you have an Android phone, there's really just Wear OS and Tyson that you can go for. And yeah, the Moto 360 third generation is, is nice because I got it to pair with my Motorola Razor Fold. But uh, I think there's definitely better values out there. Even if you want to have a Wear OS watch, you can probably get one of the Fossils. I think they're a, a better value and they'll have a similar design as well. But uh, I know that not many people are going to get the Moto 360 third generation. So this is kind of a collector's thing for me too. So that's why I got it. And yeah, Wear OS is just okay uh, as a smartwatch. All right. And then next up I have, uh, this is actually not a smartwatch. <laughs> this is the Fio M5. So it's actually an MP3 player. I have it here just for kicks, I guess. But uh, technically not a smartwatch, um, but it can function as a smartwatch because you can tell the time, right, and the date. This is mostly a music player. You can see that there is a SD card slot at the bottom, which smartwatches usually don't have. But it has a high-end DAC in it, a uh, headphone jack, right? This brings back the old 6th uh, gen. Was it the 6th gen? It brings back old 6th gen iPod Nano memories, right? That was the generation that had the the watch band strap and a lot of people used it for working out right especially at that time like you had the ipod shuffle and then the ipod nano 6th gen came out with that watch strap a lot of people used it as kind of like a pseudo proto smartwatch and uh this is just cool to have i mean you can you have you can use it as kind of like a watch right it's going to look ridiculous but you can use it and uh it's definitely the best music player out of all of them because that's what this is designed for is a dap Right, has a dedicated DAP, headphone amp. Um, so if I want to play music, especially with Bluetooth, I don't think I'm ever going to really put a wired headphone here while this is on my wrist. That would be kind of ridiculous. Um, but I think as, as far as Bluetooth is concerned, I might be using this when I work out because, you know, I want to listen to my songs in high quality. Then uh, I don't need to carry a phone. That's the other thing. A lot of these smartwatches need to tether to a phone unless you pay for some LTE plan or something like that, right? Uh, this one, you don't need to pay, pay for any data plan. You just put in your micro SD card slot, load it up with all your songs, and then um, you don't need your phone. You just, uh, all the songs are in the SD card, right? So you can just work out or go swimming or whatever. I think this is, uh, actually, I'm not sure if this is water resistant. Never mind. I thought this was, it would be nice if this was water resistant, but um, <laughs> might not be water resistant. But anyways, you can play all your songs without using a phone, without using a data plan. So that's the advantage of here. You have all your, your music files locally. So if you wanted a, a good music smartwatch, I guess, this could probably do the trick. All right. Um, and then the Samsung Galaxy Watch Active 2, uh, which I just picked up uh, a few days ago. It runs Tizen OS, and uh, like I said in a recent review, comparing this to the Wear OS on the Moto 360, I feel like this is a more optimized um, operating system for this watch. And it's just very, very smooth feeling. Yeah, it has that digital uh, rotating bezel that you can use here, although the gestures are not as good as using the crown on the Moto 360. So that's one thing that I kind of like the Moto 360 better. I like that scrolling crown. This one doesn't have that. Um, but the interface is pretty smooth, right? And uh, has Tizen OS has most of the apps that you would care about for a smartwatch. So I think for most people, this is probably the better option, right? And it is also more durable as well. So it's got a higher IP resistance rating, uh, military standard A10G certified, um, 5 ATM, right? So I think if you're looking for just a, a good watch to work out, this one contains a lot of health and fitness tracking apps as well. So again, for most Android phone users, this one's also cheaper as well, right? This is only 250 bucks. You can find it online for about $180. So yeah, I think for most Android users, uh, this is probably the better value to get compared to the Moto 360 third gen. And I think that Tizen OS in general is uh, more optimized than Wear OS. Yeah, so if you really want the Google Play Store apps, you know, get the Wear OS. But I think Tizen OS is probably going to have what you need. And then the last watch on here I'm going to talk about is the Belova, the Joseph Belova Brayton model, which is the only non-square traditional watch I have here, right? So, and that's that's really it. I wanted to get a, a traditional watch, a mechanical one, that's uh, not round-shaped, 
right? Because I want something a little bit different. And uh, this is a very Art Deco design, and I think that was really cool. It's got these angular shapes on it. Um, kind of takes some inspiration from the Cartier tank, right? So it's not the tonneau shape. I, I think tonneau shape is okay, but uh, I prefer the square shape more, and I had the Nomos Tetra before as well. And I think this one is a lot cheaper. I'm not saying it's as good as the Nomos, of course not. Nomos is gen it's definitely a higher... Uh, appreciated brand than Belova amongst watch enthusiasts, but uh, I think for the price we got this one for right, it's it's pretty decent value. Got this one for seven hundred dollars. Retails new for a thousand, so I got this at a big discount, and it is Swiss made because this is their Swiss made line, and it's using an ETA movement. So I think for seven hundred bucks, getting ETA movement is pretty good, right? Uh, and then you have a half exhibition case back on the back, which is a kind of thing unique to this watch. I don't think I seen this on other watches before in limited edition as well but uh, yeah I like the design right so if you want to look a little bit different that's what this watch is uh, for that's why I got it because sometimes you know I don't want to just wear a traditional round watch anymore I want to stand out a little bit more so this one with the square case the art deco design um, is pretty cool and uh, Belova even though they're well known for their cheaper quartz watches I think they hit it out of the park with this uh, higher-end mechanical one. So, anyways, very, very cool design. And uh, if you want to stand out more, this is also a good dress watch, right? I think square watches in general make good dress watches, plus the leather strap. Just fits in with that kind of suit and tie and maybe a fedora and a Homburg for this one because this is like a 1930s, 40s kind of throwback uh, kind of design. But, um, yeah, I think this will make a pretty good dress watch as well. So I can either choose between the... So if I just wanted to go with a general dress watch, I would probably choose the FC Slimline Moonface, right? But if I want to have something a little bit different, if I want to stand out a little bit more, I can choose the Belova. So anyways, that's it. That's my uh, watch collection, both traditional and smart watches and digital watches all together. I think there's uh, 14 of them here. So that's it, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed this little overview and... Uh, Hope to see you guys next time. Leave me any comments in the comment section below. 